So we are beginning our series, or no, continuing our series on the book of Galatians. Before I talk about that, I just want to uh, let you know that this week, perhaps already, you will be receiving a package with the um, visionary plan for the coming year, um, the ministry investment plan, as well as a pledge card. More information will follow, but at the end of this month, October 25th, we are hoping to receive our pledges for the coming year. It is a challenging time to envision what's coming in the coming year when we really don't know what's coming in the coming year, so we're trying to set up our plans in a COVID-safe, COVID-wise way. We are also counting on you for your pledges so that we can set our budget and uh, move into the new year, uh, both uh, by faith and in hope and with love. In regards to the sermon, I want to... Uh, repeat what I've said before. I'm hoping and praying that you've read through and are reading through the letter to the Galatians. Um, it's not something that you just can jump into in a moment in, in the service. I read a very few verses. Unless you've had a chance to let this letter uh, sort of percolate in your mind, uh, it might not make sense to you. In fact, I, I recommend reading it multiple times. Uh, it's only about 20-25 minutes to read it through. Um, as I said last week, this is a letter. It is a communication from Paul, the Apostle Paul, to a very specific church. So the situation is very specific. It might not seem relevant to us at first, and I hope to uh, show how it is, in fact, relevant. Um, I wanted to first start by uh, just sharing with you, I have had many opportunities uh, in my ministry to sit with people in their last hours and it's striking to me how often they will express deathbed doubts, you might say, where they're not so sure that their faith was good enough or they were strong enough as believers and could God forgive them and will they be saved? And it's tragic because Really, the message that we believe is one that's intended to inspire hope, not in ourselves, but in God's grace and mercy. And yet, I meet many people in these moments who start to question themselves and their faith. So I want to talk about um, this subject of faith in light of these questions about uh, doubts that we might have. As I said, this is a letter that Paul wrote to a specific group of churches in modern-day Turkey, Galatia at the time. These were uh, new converts. They were not Jewish converts who had a background in the uh, Old Testament or the Law of Moses. They were new to the faith, and Paul nurtured them as new believers with this basic message that Jesus Christ is God's Messiah who has come to defeat Satan and to deal with sin and to restore us from the curse of sin and to give us new life and that this is a gracious gift of God in Jesus. Jesus has come to restore God's kingdom and all you have to do is believe this good news and they did. But then a little later, after Paul had left, some Jewish Christians came from Jerusalem and said, oh, Paul was mistaken. You see, faith in Jesus is not enough. You actually have to do some other things. Like, for example, big thing in this letter is you have to be circumcised. And circumcision, of course, was the, the, the symbol of joining the, the covenant of Israel, becoming a Jew and submitting to the law of Moses. And so this whole letter is Paul talking about, look, either Jesus is enough to be saved or he's not and we're all in trouble. And last week we saw that the whole point of this letter is that Jesus is enough. And we're going to look in particular now at verse chapters 1 and 2. That's where he describes the situation, how some men from James, Jerusalem came and uh, convinced the Christians to be circumcised and to follow the law. And then he had to confront Peter himself, say, Peter, you're not following the gospel. And he, he speaks quite uh, strongly against this idea that you have to add something to Jesus. And then in uh, chapter 2, I'm just going to focus in particular on um, uh, two verses, verses 15 and 16. Um, I've, I have here printed uh, these verses. Uh, we who are Jews by birth 
and not sinful Gentiles, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And just highlighting those words. Now, it starts off kind of odd, right? It sounds like Paul's proudly saying, hey, we're better than you guys. We, we, we're Jews by birth. We're not sinful Gentiles. And yet he's writing to these Gentile believers who thought they had to become Jewish. But what he's actually saying is, we've been under the law, Jews by birth, for over a thousand years. Of all people, we should know better. We should know that we can't be justified by the works of the law. That in fact, we are no different than sinful Gentiles when it comes to our need for forgiveness. In Acts chapter 15, when the early church was wrestling with what, what do we do with the law for these new believers? And at one point, uh, James actually says, how can we impose on these Gentiles a burden that we ourselves have never been able to bear? That's what Paul's saying. We know better. We've tried. We've tried to follow the rules and live a good life. It doesn't work because we always fail somehow. The only way that we can be right with God or justified, declared innocent, forgiven, is by believing or faith in Jesus. So really the contrast then is faith that is totally trusting, it's up to him, not up to me, or what he calls here works of the law, but he's really saying the things that we do, our effort, our accomplishments, our rituals, our prayers, our church attendance, whatever we do ourselves, and it's either or. Either we are forgiven and accepted and restored by faith, by grace through faith, or we are accepted and forgiven and restored through what we do. Well, the good news of faith is it is not by what we do. So I think most of us have heard this message before. I assume you have if you've been raised in a church community. But it's not always easy to accept. And I just wanted to show you, last week I, I illustrated this by uh, talking about the, the black cloth that this world represents, right? Or the world is uh, filled with darkness and I'm kind of dressed in a dark white way too. And that God through Jesus uh, basically condemns or judges the sin that is in this world that makes this world such a dark place. And that by believing in Jesus, we are actually... Turn off the mic for a moment. We are declared innocent by just believing. God doesn't see us as dark, sinful, unloving, and unacceptable. God sees us as white as snow, to quote Isaiah, as, as clean, as justified. That word justified literally means uh, to be right or righteous. Someone said it's, it's like saying, it's just as if I'd, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. That's how God sees me. Wow. And, and believing this is what many of us may struggle with, like these deathbed doubts that people experience. But not only that, we struggle with <laughs> what's really going on in our lives, aren't we? See, I have another shirt here, and it's probably better reflects uh, how we feel about ourselves. And that is not quite as white as God says. Uh, we are aware of the dark. Uh, we, don't, we don't think we're terribly wicked, but neither do we think we're totally innocent. We are aware. We're, we're flawed. We're broken. We're incomplete. Our faith is not quite what it should be. Just a question. Um, is this shirt black with white stripes or white with black stripes? I'm saying it's white with black stripes. <laughs> that is, God sees us as white. But we have a tendency to focus on the dark that remains. And I want to talk about this because this is where the rubber hits the road. For these Galatians, they started to struggle. Well, are we truly forgiven? Uh, is there more we have to do? And how does that all tie together? 
Is this good news really that simple that I simply have to believe it? So I want to talk about faith. What is faith? Um, unfortunately, I believe we have complicated faith to some degree. The word simply means to, to be persuaded or to, to have a sense that this is right or true. But we've sometimes turned faith not into simply a, a, a sense of something being true. Uh, we've turned it into a whole list of beliefs that you have to have and believe absolutely. So we talk about the faith. And if you want to be saved, you have to agree with the faith. And then someone will introduce you to a whole list of doctrines and teachings that you have to affirm in order to be saved. And we make it so complicated that there are people going... I, some of these things I don't understand. Some of those things I have a hard time agreeing with. And some of them, I, okay, if you say so. But So is my faith dependent on being absolutely right? Hmm, that would make salvation based on my rightness, wouldn't it? It can't be based on the rightness of my faith. Because that would make something in me the basis of my salvation. Faith is not something that we offer to God and say, God, now you're impressed. It is an emptying of self. It is basically saying there's nothing in me that can take hold of this message. In fact, if it were up to me in any way, I couldn't make it. By myself, I can't do it. I need help. So when I look at faith and examples of faith in the Bible... We sometimes see uh, descriptions of faith like uh, Hebrews 1, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Well, yes, that is a, a pure definition of faith, and it also talks about a pure definition of love. But it doesn't mean that we have those. We may aim for those, long for those, but in reality, there are times when there are doubts and uncertainties. That word confidence used in Hebrews 1 simply means to take your stand under. And, and it's sort of like the th criminal on the cross. Basically, he had nothing left. Did he understand everything about Jesus and who Jesus was, the incarnation and the trinity and the kingdom? No, he just knew that on his own he needed help. And he looked at Jesus and said, I, I take my stand under you. I, I, I'm looking to you. I need you. It's very simple. You see, that's what strikes me about all the people who came to Jesus. Their faith, in terms of checking off all of the items on a, on, a, on a creed, was probably not just weak. It may have been non-existence in some ways. But they somehow knew that Jesus had something they needed. And they submitted to him, not sure where it would go, but trusting themselves to him. And he forgave people. He didn't interview them first and find out whether their faith measured up. He healed people. He didn't first well, observe their lives to make sure that they were good enough to be healed. Simple, sincere, ordinary people came to Jesus. And he responded with grace. This is so important because I'm thinking of that deathbed person and what I would have to say to them to help them see that it's not up to them or to the strength of their faith or the goodness of their life. There are three dimensions of faith that we sometimes speak of. The Catechism talks about knowing our sin, knowing Jesus as our Savior and Lord, and um, obeying or living a life of gratitude or obedience. And I use different words. You, you may recognize this threefold pattern of I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus as my Savior and I commit myself to following Him with the Spirit's help, the ABCs. But it's the basic rhythm. Somehow, everyone who came to Jesus had a sense of something is wrong in me. Something is right in Jesus. And I put myself forward to Jesus and seek His help his forgiveness, his guidance, his direction for my life. And these three rhythms or dimensions, I believe, are essential. But I want to I go a bit further than just say repentance, confidence, and obedience because we'll sometimes point that to people and say, well, unless you've repented, you can't be saved, right? Well, that's true, but what does that mean? And unless you're, you're confident in Jesus and not in yourself, you can't be saved. Well, that's true, but to what extent? What if our confidence is not perfect? 
And how about obedience? What if we're not following all the rules? Then can our faith be legitimate? That's what the Galatians were being told. And we have to unpack the meaning. And I think the, the um, important thing to understand here is that what God seeks in faith is not, first of all, whether it, whether it matches a list or is correct or righteous, because that would be something that we would have to do in order to receive grace, but rather, really, is it humble? Is it simple? Is it sincere? I think of this deathbed doubt. And I, I, say, I say, said to this person something along the lines of, you know, when they're doubting their faith and they're, whether they're saved, I said, do you want to be saved? Oh, yeah. Do you, do you believe that, you know, you have things that you've done that are wrong? That's why I can't be sure, you know, because of all the badness in my life. Uh, there's that hum humble spirit, right? Humble repentance. Now, do they understand everything? No, but they have a sense that something's not right. And do you want to believe in Jesus? Yes. Yes. Do you, you believe that Jesus came for you? Well, I don't know if he came for me, but I know he came, and I wish that I could believe that. And I long said, do you, do you wish your life was better? Yeah, I, I, I'm not proud of the things I did. All the signs to me are imperfectly, black and white, not pure. This person's heart was directed towards God and Jesus in a humble, sincere, and simple way. And I said, God's grace is exactly for you. It's because and precisely you can't do it and that your faith isn't strong enough that God comes to you in Jesus and welcomes you. Humble and sincere and simple faith. I especially like that word humble, and I want to unpack just those three dimensions of faith with this word humble. So humble repentance. Do you have to repent of absolutely every single sin in your life for that repentance to be real? Because if we do, we're in trouble. We still don't know the half of it. You know, we talk about the great commandment or the two great commandments or the ten great commandments or 642 or 24 commandments in the Old Testament or there are 10,000 subtle nuances of the ways that we defy these commandments. When I did my profession of faith so many years ago, did I fully comprehend everything that was sin? No. In some ways, I was ignorant of, of, of sin in my life. Furthermore, there were some things that I thought were good in my life. If someone said, that's a sin, I would say, no, it's not, and I would defend it from the Bible. But what if it wasn't right? What if I believed something was good, but it was actually wrong, and I didn't repent of it? Could I be forgiven? You see, humble repentance says, God, I don't know the half of it. I just know that something is wrong in me. Something is not right in the way that it ought to be. And, and there are some things that I struggle with and there are some things that I don't struggle with, but whatever it is, it's not based on my repentance or full understanding. I just know I need help. I need mercy. And however you understand it, even if it's in a very beginning stage, if you've ever talked to someone who... Uh, did not have had learning disabilities, for example, and you try to explain things like sin and faith and justification and stuff, much of it just goes over their head. But we've never said, oh, that's too bad. You don't understand. No. They come as they are and as they are able. able. And over time, God works that repentance out, and they learn and grow, and some things they'll never figure out. But even then, in the end, it's still grace. Humble repentance. I think we as believers ought to be known especially by this. The first thing people ought to hear out of our lips is not, you're a sinner, but I'm a sinner. So that we can show them what it looks like. When we say you're a sinner, their defenses go up and they return the attack. But when we come in humble repentance to say, you know what, I first of all want to say I am no better, no different. I struggle. My faith is not pure. It is not based on me or my faith or my goodness. It's Jesus. Humble repentance. Secondly, humble confidence. 
absolute confidence in Jesus, a wholehearted assurance, you know, as the catechism says, well, amen, if I could be, but I don't always have that. There are times when there are things on that list of doctrines that I've said yes to in the past, I say, I'm not so, you know, I read different, I read different things in the Bible and I sometimes re- interpret it differently. Does that make my reinterpretations right? No. Does it make the creeds wrong? No. Does it make them right? No. I don't base my confidence on my interpretation of the Bible. I don't place my confidence in my proper understanding of the Trinity or the Incarnation. There are probably things that we still don't understand, and when we meet Jesus, we won't even fully understand. But my confidence does not lie in the rightness of my faith, but in the rightness of Jesus to make me whole. I just want to encourage you to see this. Don't beat yourself up if your faith is not strong. When you see Jesus saying to you, why, oh, you of little faith, we sometimes see that as a stern rebuke. I hear it as a loving, gracious invitation. He was not condemning. He was drawing people to learn and discover more. So your faith is not where it should be? Join the club. If you struggle with that, know that your pastor does too. If you have a problem with that, then talk to me. But I can assure you that my faith goes in the ebbs and flows and has times of strength and times of weakness. But through it all, he has remained faithful, and that's my hope, not me. How about humble obedience? Is it necessary that everyone who becomes a Christian give up every sin well yes every sin that they are aware of every sin that they've sensed the Lord calling them to give up on but what about my list of sins what if I believe that the Sabbath is a command that we all need to follow the seventh day Sabbath do you have to repent of it and if you don't does that mean you're not saved well you could say well what makes you right Norm (laughs) well that's the question I just read an article by John MacArthur. Some of you may know him as a preacher, and he was going on at length, talking about how infant baptism is not God's will. And those who persist in this practice are disobeying God. And unless they repent, they do not know the grace of God in Jesus. Now, I've just put that out there. Our tradition is either living in unrepented sin or perhaps... In a humble way, we interpret Scripture differently. And we say, you know, thanks for sharing that, John. I appreciate that. I will wrestle with that some more. I will go back to Scripture. But in the end, I need to do what proceeds out of my faith and not just abide by the rules that you impose on me. I need to wrestle with Scripture, but in the end, I need to take my stand. And when I do, I'm not to tell you that my position is God's position and yours is not. I need to humbly say, here I stand. May God have mercy on me. You see, we like to measure other people's repentance and obedience to see if it measures up to ours and our interpretation. But the scary thing is, there are so many interpretations out there. Whose is right? In fact, I would argue there are no two Christians who agree on anything. And if being right is a requirement for salvation then only one person could be saved. And I don't even think that would happen. You see, the question of the heart comes in again and again. And at the final day when I stand before Jesus, if I have the audacity to say, my repentance was right, my faith was right, my obedience was right, I will have just presented to Jesus the reasons why he should save me because of me. The only thing that I can claim from beginning to end and when I stand before Jesus is this. Not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul. Not my right education or confession of faith or doctrines. Not because I was reformed or believed in the Apostles' Creed. I have one claim, one hope, and that's Jesus and his grace and what he did for me. And all else is but dust compared to knowing Jesus. 
Justified by grace through humble faith. Jesus told a parable in Luke 8, 18. The only time the word justified is used in the Gospels. And it's speaking about a tax collector, a sinner, who comes to the temple and just breaks down before God in humility. And did he fully understand his sin? No. Did he fully understand God? Probably not. Was he obeying? I don't know. And then there's this Pharisee, and he lifts off all of his credentials. I thank you that I'm not like that person. I thank you that my repentance is complete. I thank you that my faith is based on the creeds. I think. And Jesus says the tax collector went away justified, not the Pharisee. We need to face the fact that there is no way we can present anything to God that will make us look better in and of ourselves. The only claim we have is Jesus. I am thankful for grace. I hope you are, because if it wasn't for grace, none of us would have a hope. When you read this letter, I don't know if you can sense Paul's passion. He actually gets quite worked up. But he's worked up in particular about grace. You know, he recognizes that there's differences in a lot of ways and that the Gentile Christians are not like the Jewish Christians and each one has to wrestle through what their faith looks like in day-to-day -day living. But the one thing that he gets so worked up about is when people put something in the way of grace. It's the same with Jesus. Jesus was extremely tolerant of sinners. But the religious leaders... If Jesus had a hard word to say, it was for the religious people who tried to put barriers and walls between God and sinners. Paul's passion ought to be our passion. And we ought to feel deep within our bones that we desperately need God's forgiveness. And so does the next person. So does that person on their deathbed who's not feeling good enough. So does that person that you work with whose life does not measure up to what you would call a normal Christian life. So does that person who has given up their faith because they can't believe many of the things that we believe. We all need grace. And if we can't be a grace community, then we have failed in being a gospel community. That's what we need more than anything else. So look around you. Do you realize that the one criteria for being a member of this church really is that no perfect people are allowed. So if you're perfect, you're excused. I know no one will leave, although some might think they are, but they can. Grace and simply believing. So I'm going to end there, but I'm not done the series. And you're wondering, yeah, but. I know the yeah, buts that are going on in your head. Read the letter to the Galatians and about the life that comes. The life I live, now live, Paul says. I've been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. The life I now live, I live by the law? No, I live by faith. And we'll look next week and the week after at what that means. In the meantime, let's pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. My faith is weak, but you are strong. My sin goes deep, but your grace goes deeper. Despite the imperfection of my repentance, confidence, and obedience, remind me that I am always and only saved by grace. Amen.